I thought that I was far too gone for everything I've done wrong. I'm the one who dug this grave, but you call my name, you call my name. All at once, I came alive. This beating heart, these open eyes, the grave they Hey sis. hey sis! Hey sis! Thanks to Kia Luster and the ladies of the Sister Circle for making the walk at Freedom Park a fun, health forward success. We look forward to more events with the Sister Circle coming soon. Something new. Hey y'all, the Something Different, Something New auditions were fun and quite productive. Thank you to all who auditioned. Good stuff is on the way. Hey, Greater Works family, Father's Day is next Sunday. What? That's right, next Sunday. We want all the fathers and father figures to feel honored and loved. We're asking all fathers to send in your very best picture to the email address gwcfathers at gmail.com. P.S. I said P.S. Ladies, if you have a great picture of these dapper debonair GWC men, send it on in to gwcfathers at gmail.com Last but not least, GWC family, have you subscribed to Greater Work Center YouTube page? If not, please take time to subscribe and share. Hi family, I just want to say thank you for all of you who continue to send your tithes and your love offering. You have helped Greater Work Center to maintain through this time of social distancing and as we launch and try to expand our digital ministry. And I just want to ask that you please continue to do what you have done and that's to show support because the Bible says that we are, we are blessed to be a blessing. And your generosity has helped us to bless so many people. So I would just ask that you continue to do as God has commanded, that you bring the tithes and the offering so that there may be meat in the storehouse for the time that may be coming. So we pray that our economy sustained and that it, nobody is at loss in the future. But we know the reality is that may happen. And Greater Works wants to be uh, a vessel to be able to bless people that they might be able to go through the time to come and know that God was on their side. So thank you again for your giving and your support. They are the best and the worst you created Loving and hating and opinionated Loners in basements and those congregated Deliver me Far from the peaceful shore I was sinking Deep in the ocean of thoughts they were thinking Don't know what validation I was sinking Deliver me People, when you said you could heal me from many things, did you mean people? People, deliver me, cause I can't point them out. I won't say the names, I don't know the damage or which one to blame. Just people, people, deliver me. Mm -hmm. She was the reason I smiled in the morning. He 
took the last bit of joy I was storing That's too much power for anything human deliver me from People, people I know you can heal me from many things What about people, people Deliver me Cause I can't point them out I won't say the names I won't know the damage Of which one to blame It's just people, people And the broken are breaking And the ones who had their joy taken away Are out here taking From other people 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 Forgive people Always, it's a blessing that you have chosen to join us here for Back Porch Phrase. Thank you for making Greater Works Center part of your Sunday. I want to ask you a question this morning. What if after this sermon you heard a knock on your door and when you went to answer it, for some reason the man standing outside is familiar even though you've never seen him before? After examining the scars on his forehead and the wounds on his hands, you realize that it's Jesus. Of course, you invite him in. He walks into your living room and sits down. You sit across from him. The question is not, what will you say to him, but what will he say to you? What will the conversation with Christ sound like? What do you think Christ wants to say? This morning, I want us to talk about what we can learn from a conversation with our Savior. Our text today will be coming from John 4, beginning at the fourth verse. The New King James Version reads this way. But he had to pass through Samaria. Now he came to a Samaritan town called Sychar, near the plot of land that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, since he was tired from the journey, sat down right beside the well. It was about noon. 
A Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me some water to drink. For his disciples had gone off into the town to buy supplies. So the Samaritan woman asked him, How can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for water to drink? For the Jews have nothing in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you had known the gift of God, and who it is who said to you, Give me some water to drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said to him, You have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Surely you're not greater than our ancestor Jacob, are you? For he gave us this well and drank from it himself, along with his sons and his livestock. Moving down to verse 23, uh, it continues with Jesus saying, A time is coming, and now is here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. In verse 24 says, God is spirit, and the people who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, the one called Christ. Whenever he comes, he will tell us everything. Jesus said to her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. First, before we get into uh, the scriptures, let's talk about the background of the conversation that's about to happen. The Bible uses the phrase, Jesus must needs go through Samaria. Jesus did a lot of traveling. He passed from Judea to Galilee countless times. And nowhere else in the Bible does it present us with the idea that Jesus had no choice about where he went. But this time, in the King James Version, it says, he must needs go through Samaria. Now it's true that geographically Samaria was a region you had to pass through to get to Galilee. But I believe God is trying to, to show us something for the sake of healing and salvation, uh, that we must all go through something. You see, the Samaritans and the Jews were fierce enemies. Uh, their hatred for one another went back hundreds of years. The Jews felt like the Samaritans had bad religion. To them, the Samaritans simply didn't worship right. They mixed in the worship of other gods with the worship of the God of Israel. This happened because when the children of Israel were taken into exile, the Samaritans escaped and intermarried with the Assyrians. When the children of Israel returned to Samaria, the Samaritans tried to welcome them with open arms, but the children of Israel rejected them and labeled them unclean. The hostility grew as time passed. They fought, burned down the holy temples, and even enslaved one another. But the truth is, the Samaritans were as much God's children as the Jews. They just couldn't see past the anger and the hatred they had passed down over generations. Sound familiar? So Jesus going through Samaria was more than just a pit stop. It was God sending him to have a conversation of reconciliation. This is the kind of conversation we are needing in America right now. In verse 6 it says that Jesus was tired so he came to rest at Jacob's well while the disciples went into the town for supplies. Now this was no ordinary well. This well was important for the Samaritans because it was one of the few holy things they had left uh, after their feud with the Jews. People didn't just come to the well for water, they came to be close to God. What is significant is the time that Jesus and the woman met at the well, the sixth hour or noon. Most people of that time would have went to the well early to have their, blessing, their, to have their day blessed. Or they would have went at night for a blessing before they went to sleep, but this woman went to the well at noon most likely so that she could be alone. Some people believe she was rejected because of the relationships, because of her past, because of her reputation. But the time was also important because it was the sixth hour. Again, six is the number of man's limitation. There are six days in the week for man, but the seventh day is for God. The sixth hour is also significant because it's the hour that, that the crucifixion of Christ began. The Bible says he was crucified from the sixth to the ninth hour. At the sixth hour, God had to reject his son so he could accept man. This conversation begins with a symbolic acknowledgement that only God can change a heart. Sometimes when we sit down with people we disagree with, we think that we must convince them that our way is better. And sometimes people go to great lengths to scare, 
manipulate, and even confuse them. That's what's going on a lot these days. There are a lot of hate groups trying to scare us into giving up our rights. We have media that tries to manipulate us into seeing uh, people the way they want us to see them. There are people who make up alternative facts so that we are confused as to what we should believe. But I want to remind all the children of God that God is not the author of confusion. As a matter of fact, his love makes everything simple. He gave us one command to satisfy them all. Love one another as he has loved you. It's a simple equation. If you wonder if you should help a brother in need, has God ever helped you? Yes. Then help your brother. Wonder if people who have sinned have rights. Well, did God ever love you past your mistakes? Yes. Then give grace to those who have fallen. How should you treat another race? Well, an African man named Simeon was the only person who was willing to carry the cross of salvation for Christ. That probably means that you should be willing to look past skin color to help someone bear their burdens too. It's not your job to convince anyone to convince anyone of anything, but it is your command to love everyone. As we continue, we see that the Samaritan woman arrives and Jesus does something unusual, if not scandalous. He speaks to her. This simply didn't happen between a Jewish man and a Samaritan woman. It's kind of hard to know somebody without saying a word to them. And it's sad how often people in our world make a judgment about people they have never said a word to. How foolish must a person be to think they know something about someone based on a 10-minute news story or because of some negative story or negative experience somebody has second or third hand. Children of God, if your circle only looks like you, then you are not hearing the truth. You're just hearing echoes. The Bible says that Jesus said to her, give me some water to drink. So the Samaritan woman said to him, how can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for water to drink? For Jews use nothing in common with Samaritans. What's significant here is that she asked him how could he ask her for water to drink, not why he asked her for water to drink. You see, for Jesus to touch anything she touched would mean that he would be religiously unclean. This reminds us of Jim Crow in the South, where some whites believed that black and brown skin was contagious, almost like a virus. So the Samaritan woman wanted to know how Jesus was going to touch a cup that she had touched and consider himself a good Jew. But Jesus knew that the only way he could consider himself a good Jew is if he did allow himself to connect with her. I'm so glad to see both black and white people standing up for human rights in this country. But whether you are black or white, don't consider what you're doing as courageous. Instead, consider it as righteous because that's the highest call of a child of God, to do what Christ would do. Jesus gave her purpose by requesting that she serve him, but Jesus actually began this conversation the way we should all begin difficult conversations, by seeking something in common. See, a heart-changing conversation begins by seeking common ground, not a dividing conflict. Brothers and sisters, so many of us are armed to the teeth with facts and figures and statistics, and all of that will be dismissed by someone with a hardened heart. But I guarantee if you sit down and you ask somebody, tell me what you love, the both of you will be nodding your heads in agreement in no time. You see, the majority of people, when separated from the opinions of people who are trying to manipulate them for their own selfish reasons, want the same things. They want to prosper. They want the people they love to be safe. They want to be healthy, and they want to make a difference in the world. What happens is they are told that someone across town, across a border, who doesn't look like them, wants to take what they have. They give in to fear. Or they are told that if someone else has, that means that they can't have. The first trick of the enemy is always to make us think that things are scarce. He tells us that God doesn't provide enough. He told Eve that in the garden. And he's been telling that to every race of people ever since. But I stopped by to tell you, like Jesus tells the woman at the well, that God is a source that never runs dry. 
He has cattle on a thousand hills, and he supplies all our needs according to his riches and glory. The Bible says that the righteous are never forsaken or left to beg for bread. But if we give in to fear of one another, we end up with a system where a small percentage of greedy people control all the resources. And it's our own fault for listening to the enemy instead of sharing what we have in common. And so they continue their conversation, and Jesus says to the woman, if you had known the gift of God and who it is who said to you, give me some water to drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So first Jesus finds something that they have in common, then he offers her a gift. And this is a strange way to begin a conversation with someone you see as your enemy. But it's how the children of God have to speak. Jesus tells her, if you knew the gift in front of you, you, would be focused, you wouldn't be focused on my race or my religion. You know, I feel sorry for people who are racist or prejudiced. I do. I, I don't fear them. They have nothing to fear. How can you fear a coward hiding behind a sheet, trying to intimidate people with a shaved head, or a semi-automatic rifle striped to their chest. It would be comical if it wasn't so sad. I feel sorry for them because they miss out on knowing some of the most beautiful people in the world. They will never have the joy of seeing the world through someone else's eyes. To be prejudiced is to be a prisoner of your own perception. That is, that kind of life is both boring and pathetic. If you think black or white is the only color that has something to offer, then you are saying that God made a mistake in creating all this beautiful variety. If you're walking through life and thinking that you're smarter than God, then I know why you're mad. You're mad because you keep finding out how wrong you are. Seeing the joy of people without your fear makes you angry. But you can't really live if you're always looking for guilt rather than a gift. You will always be miserable if you are looking for a spot instead of what makes somebody special. Many years ago, I lived next door to a police officer. One day we were standing outside and we were talking and I asked him if he was ever able to turn it off. He said, turn what off? I said the suspicion that someone is doing something wrong. He thought for a minute and he said, no. He then said, and I hate it. He said, I look for something wrong in everyone, my wife, my kids, strangers I meet on the street, and you know, my heart broke for him when he said, and I don't know how to live any other way. That was 25 years ago, and unfortunately, now we're all like that, looking for what's wrong instead of looking for the gift in people. But a heart-changing conversation looks for the gift in a person, not the guilt. God tells us time and time again not to judge. God doesn't want us to be naive, but he wants us to trust him to have an impact in people's lives in a way that causes them to change. And I'm not saying not to fight for change. We must be passionate about, our, about righteousness. But we must also be aware that real equality comes as a result of a heart change and a law change. Remember, God made the law to change behavior, but the law was incomplete without the blood of Jesus to change hearts. You know, the woman wasn't moved by all Jesus' kind gestures. And those of you who are fighting for change have to know that this is not going to be a Disney movie ending. This will be a long fight full of rejection, anger, and bitterness. The woman says to Christ, the well is deep and you don't have anything to draw with. She tells the Savior of the world that he is not equipped. I have sensed that many of you are frustrated and weary. You're afraid to say it, but you're wondering if Jesus is enough. You want to yell, fight, and even buy a gun. You are sick and tired of being sick and tired. You have been praying all your life and nothing seems to have changed. Well, I just want to tell you, Jesus is enough. Change your perspective. Instead of thinking about what has happened, take a look at what hasn't happened. What might God have prevented? You see, we can both be thankful for progress and passionately demand that more change has to happen but to think that Jesus or God has failed us is to think that man has all the power well I challenge any man to make the Sun come up or push back the tides I wait the woman tells Jesus he can't draw water 
But what the woman didn't realize is that Jesus drew her to the well. And if he drew her to the well, he's certainly able to draw water out of the well. Family, my point is, you can't have a heart-changing conversation without the one who invented the heart. Only God can change your heart. Don't give up on God because he won't give up on you. He is able. And I know what you're saying, Pastor, I'm not giving up on God. Then don't give up on what God loves. Give up, giving up on God looks like arming yourself with a gun without arming yourself with prayer. Giving up on God means preparing for test results instead of preparing for a testimony. Giving up on God means filing divorce before discussing your true feelings. God hasn't failed. He just isn't finished. Speaking of feelings, the woman says to Jesus, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Surely you're no greater than our ancestor Jacob, are you? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, along with his sons and his livestock. You know, the first part of the statement, the woman is expressing her pain for all that she suffered. She says, you have no bucket and the well is deep. What she's telling Jesus is that I'm hurting in a place so deep that I can no longer reach it, and I doubt you can. I know a lot of you are listening to me and feeling that's that way about a number of things. It hurts in such a deep place, and the hurt is buried under anger, depression, low self-esteem, rejection, and even grieving. But Jesus can reach it. He was there when it happened. He cried with you. He stayed up late at night when you were worried and even suicidal. He was there when friends rejected you, not knowing that they were rejecting him too. He, he knows exactly where the hurt is. You just, have, you just have to trust him to minister to it. But she quickly covers up that powerful moment of vulnerability by trying to start an argument about religion. She brings up something related to the conflict between the Samaritans and the Jews. Instead of seeking connection, she argues religion. She wants to prove that she is right. Remember what I said earlier about facts and truth? But if you want to have a heart-changing conversation, you have to decide if you want to be right or you want to have a relationship. You see, if you develop an honest relationship full of trust, God will eventually get you to what's right. But I can't tell you as a counselor and a pastor how many times I've counseled uh, people in a marriage or even in a friendship that ended, not because the people didn't love each other, but because they thought that being right was more important than the relationship. Christ knew the law. He was there when it was written. He co-wrote it. But even with all the sins of the Samaritans, when he sat down with this woman, her sins were not the first thing that he addressed. He did address them, but again, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. This country, like every individual in it, has a lot of sins that need addressing. But we can't talk about sins until we talk about the beliefs that make sins possible. And nobody wants to talk about their shameful sins with someone they don't have a relationship with. That's why a lot of us don't want to talk to God about our sins, because we don't have a relationship with him either. You know, but Jesus is relentless in the way he offers grace to this woman. He says to her, everyone who drinks some of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. But the water that I give him will become a fountain of water springing up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I will not have to be thirsty or come here to draw again. Jesus not only offers her a purpose and a gift, he's now offering her a part of himself to assist her in changing. He offers her living water from which he is the source. There are some people who are realizing they want better in this country. Although they have benefited from privilege, they want to do better. They don't want their privilege to be a poison to others. And they are open to learning how to be better. And there are a lot of us who are saying, I've already given enough. I don't have the time nor the inclination to give you any more of me. But I just want to remind you that Christ gave everything he had right until his last breath and drop of blood. You are in eternal debt despite all that you've been through. Christ doesn't want you to become a victim anymore, but his desire is not that you harden your heart, because if you do that, then you cease to look and love like him. Now the woman is open to changing. Now that the woman is open to changing, Jesus tells her, go get your husband. 
Now, this woman really doesn't have a husband. By Jewish law and the law today, to sleep with someone makes them your spouse. So Jesus is asking her to go get her sins. Her six adulterous affairs, all six of them. Again, six is the number of man's limitation. Without Christ's love and, and grace, man at his best still misses the mark. But Christ isn't asking her to get her six husbands so he can shame her. He wants to show her that the hurt of those six painful relationships can only be healed by a relationship with the seventh man. Seven is God's number of perfection. The seventh man didn't hide his relationship with her. No, he met her at the well at high noon. He is having a conversation with her right now that offers her a life without shame, anger, or regret. A heart-changing conversation shares the part of you that Christ first shared with you, his grace. You see, God didn't draw you with threats. His word says he draws you with a loving kindness. Grace is the hard thing. Christ said we must pray for our enemies. We must pray for those who spitefully use us. Now, there are some of you that say this kind of message is what makes black people weak. But I will tell you, this is where we have drawn our strength. It is black folk in America who have endured, yet still shared our gifts, culture, wisdom, and intelligence. We will no longer be exploited and ignored, but we will not cease to be gracious and giving. You see, we share the same supernatural grace as Christ. It's in our spiritual DNA. Black folk don't let anyone tell you that this is the slave master's faith. Grace always finds a way. And yes, the word of God was used to manipulate us on plantations the same way the devil used it in the wilderness to tempt Jesus. But after Christ endured that temptation, he received power that changed the world. My friends, despite slavery, Jim Crow, and systematic oppression, our gifts are the center of the world's joy. Be encouraged and keep loving beyond limits. The last thing Jesus does in this conversation is engage in a discussion of the law. The woman can't get over all the things that have been said to her about her people being unholy. She asks about the places she worships. Jesus lets her know it's not about where you worship, but who you worship. He lets her know that they serve the same God and that God sent him for the sins of everyone. And I'm amazed that those that separate themselves by race also claim to love Jesus. Sometimes it feels like we are children of a different God. Jesus tells her a time is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. God is spirit and people who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. My friends, if we hold hate in our hearts, if we ignore the injustices of our world, if we act like one of God's children is more worthy of grace than another of them, then we're not honoring God's truth. And if our worship is not truthful, then it does not honor God. A heart-changing conversation honors God's truth. The truth hurts. It can even make us uncomfortable. But it's also what sets us free. Free to love, free to grow, free to sit in the company of Christ and experience the abundant life that he died to give to all of us. That's all I got. I pray this word has been a blessing. I pray that you will let the truth of God set you free. The truth help you to connect and love one another. Won't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give you praise and we thank you. And dear God, we thank you that you are a God whose love is unlimited and unceasing. That God, you will meet us at our point of pain the same way that Christ met this woman at the well. And God, we know that it is your desire that we would love one another, that we would seek you in all things. And God, there may be somebody under the sound of my voice who struggles with the pain and the anger and the frustration that they're feeling with what's going on in our world and what's going on in their lives. God, I would just ask that you would wrap your loving arms around them and let them know that you are there and you've always been there. And dear God, help them to understand that their mistakes do not push you from them. In fact, your word says that where sin abounds, your love overly abounds. 
So God, help them to know that all have sinned and come short of the glory. But if they would just trust you with their heart, with their pain, even with their anguish, dear God, you will turn all of their tests into a testimony. So God, now I ask that you would remind them that as they pray this prayer, as they seek you out, dear God, knowing that they're not expected to be perfect, but that they are perfectly loved, that if they can pray this prayer of salvation, they are now saved. They are eternally yours. And God, I ask too that you would pray, that, you would, that your loving mercy would rule and abide within this ministry. That Greater Work Center digital ministry as well as our in-person ministry, dear God, may continue to flourish and continue to be beacons of love for a hurting world. Oh God, we love you, but every time we walk through your scripture and see how you sent Jesus to be the human embodiment of love and grace, every time we see that, God, we realize that you love us even more. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, thank you for joining us for Back Porch Praise. May God keep you and bless you is my prayer. Hey family, I just want to thank you for all of your support. The ministry of Greater Work Center and this message of love and grace is growing and it is spreading, but we need to keep the ball rolling. We need to continue to reach out to a world that might not know the fullness of the love of God. So I'm going to ask you as a personal favor that you share this broadcast and go to our YouTube page and subscribe. See, when you su su subscribe, we're able to reach more people. We're, uh, we're able to um, do greater things as far as spreading the word of God. And I, I need your help. Greater Work Center needs your help. But most of all, your Heavenly Father wants you to fulfill the commandment of loving each other as he has loved you. And the best way and one of the quick ways you can show love to somebody is making sure they get the word of God. So I just want to thank you in advance. And again, God bless you.